I'd like you to follow along as I read from the Acts of the Apostles in chapter 3, uh, beginning at verse 11. Acts chapter 3 and verse 11. And as you're turning there, a moment just to say that it is a privilege to be here and um, to have looked forward to this and now to uh, discover the reality of what I have imagined in my mind. You're a much better looking group than I imagined, to be very honest. I, um, uh, Kilmarnock is not alien territory to me. Uh, uh, 67 years ago, I lived on McClellan Drive in Kilmarnock. And uh, uh, sometime in the next couple of days, I'm going to go down that road wherever it is and uh, try, and, try and find out uh, uh, where, where I was. So I'm glad to be here. I look forward to these couple of days. I also want to make a confession, and that is that um, I've decided to change the title for uh, the whole series, all right? You have, to, you have to understand that when people ask you to do these things months and months in advance, and then they say, well, we need a title. And I haven't a clue what I'm doing next Sunday, so how would I know what I was doing, you know, here in a year's time? So I decided a generic title like In Christ Alone would give me complete freedom. And uh, it turned out that it didn't actually at all. And, uh, but I'm still on the same, the same track. We're going to spend three nights uh, with our focus on the Lord Jesus. Uh, the title, if you want a title for the three nights, that would be, instead of in Christ alone, although it covers that, the incomparable Christ, the incomparable Christ. We already sang about this, uh, Lord, there is none like you. And so we'll be thinking along those lines. It reminds me actually too of it, as it, just I'm speaking to you, that the, uh, the curate in the Anglican church was uh, excited about the fact that he was going to speak uh, for the very first time in the church where he was an assistant minister. And he was excited about it and wanted guidance on it. And he wrote to the, the bishop uh, who had ordained him. And he told him, I'm going to preach for the first time next Sunday. And uh, dear bishop, what should I preach about? And the bishop sent a postcard back that said, dear curate, preach about God and preach about 20 minutes. So <laughs> I'm going to preach about Jesus. And uh, if, uh, if my brother back there doesn't make me boom like this, then I think we'll be, I think we'll, we'll be fine. Uh, Acts chapter 3 and uh, verse 11. Uh, this, uh, we pick up the reading after the, the healing of uh, the man at the gate beautiful. Peter and John have been used of God in that way. And then we read, uh, while he clung to Peter and John, all the people ran together to them in the portico called Solomon's, astounded. And when Peter saw it, he addressed the people. Men of Israel, why do you wonder at this? Or why do you stare at us as though by our own power or piety we have made him walk? The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant Jesus, whom you delivered over and denied in the presence of Pilate when he had decided to release him. But you denied the holy and righteous one, and asked for a murderer to be granted to you. And you killed the author of life, whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witnesses, and his name, by faith in his name, has made this man strong, whom you see and know. And the faith that is through Jesus has given the man this perfect health in the presence of you all. And now, brothers, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did also your rulers. But what God foretold by the mouth of all the prophets, that his Christ would suffer, he thus fulfilled. Repent, therefore, and turn again, that your sins may be blotted out, that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send the Christ appointed for you, Jesus, whom heaven must receive until the time for restoring all the things about which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets long ago. Moses said, The Lord God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brothers. You shall listen to him in whatever he tells you. And it shall be that every soul who does not listen to that prophet shall be destroyed from the people. And all the prophets who have spoken from Samuel 
and those who came after him also proclaimed these days, you are the sons of the prophets and of the covenant that God made with your fathers, saying to Abraham, and in your offspring shall all the families of the earth be blessed. God, having raised up his servant, sent him to you first to bless you by turning every one of you from your wickedness. Just another brief prayer, an Anglican prayer. Father, what we know not, teach us. What we have not, give us. What we are not, make us. For your Son's sake, amen. Well, we come to these three studies in a context that uh, can be described in various ways. In one sense, it is wonderfully exciting to think that on a Friday evening in a place like this, uh, we have assembled in this way, and we have sung to the praise of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But we also recognize that we are a tiny, tiny part of the vastness of our surrounding friends and neighbors. And we also recognize that as a church, Big C, we are a diminishing number within the context in which we live. I speak particularly of here, but it is also true of the United States from which I've come. And we're learning, as it were, for the first time uh, what it is going to be like to live as aliens and strangers. We have sung about it in our songs, some of us, for many, many years, and we've often wondered, I wonder what that would be like uh, to be somebody like that. And all of a sudden, with every day that dawns and every newspaper that we read and every news broadcast that comes our way, it is made perfectly clear to us that we're living in a culture that is increasingly corrupted, that we're living in a world that is desperately sick, that we're living in an environment where men and women are completely confused about just about everything. And so it would be terrific if we could then say, but of course, we have a church, and the church throughout our nation is so strong and powerful and influential at every level. Sadly, we're not able to say that. I haven't come across the ocean to make comments on your newspapers, but I read them daily uh, where I am. And certainly, the remarks of recent days and the decisions of recent days point to a situation that is largely opposed to the very foundations of the Christian gospel. And that would be bad enough were it not for the fact that individual Christians are increasingly fearful, increasingly fearful, not of living, but of speaking, of being prepared to say something, of being able to speak truth into a world that is filled with error. And one of the biggest needs for us as believing people, I suggest, is to understand in a renewed way what it really means for us to have been united with Christ, that we are placed into Christ, and that we serve alongside Christ, and that we are enabled by the Holy Spirit. And fundamental to that is an understanding of who Jesus is. Uh, many of us will have grown up singing that song, everybody ought to know, everybody ought to know, everybody ought to know who Jesus is. And of course, yes, we want to tell people who Jesus is. But if we're going to tell him who he is, then we need to know who he is. And J.B. Phillips many years ago wrote a book entitled, Your God is Too Small. And I wonder if we might write another book along the lines of, Your Christ is Too Easily Ignored. So much of the media portrays anything to do with the church as a strange group of people. The pastors are the worst. The ministers are the worst of all. They're all weak-kneed chaps. They always look like they fell down a drain and nobody wanted to pull them back out. And there we have it, the picture of it. I am jolly is long dead, but his legacy remains. There we have it. I've had a terrible day. Oh, yes. <laughs> Last call, last call. So what I want to do, I want to try and do this, is point out, and starting here in this section of Acts, that the way in which the apostles hit the streets of Jerusalem is absolutely 
uh, emblematic of the way in which spirit-filled Christians in every generation are granted the privilege of going onto the streets and into the communities of our neighborhoods to tell people about this Jesus, this incomparable Jesus, this one who is like no other person. He is not fighting for a place in the pantheon of religious people. He stands out uniquely so. And that is, of course, when you read the opening of the Acts, exactly what these men were doing. Uh, there's a sort of divine invasion that takes place in, in Jerusalem. And they hit the streets with a, with a waft of the supernatural, if you like, causing people to say, what is going on here? What are these people doing? What is it that fires them in such a manner? Well, of course, it is the outpouring of the Holy Spirit who now is bringing them into an understanding of who Jesus is and what Jesus has done. And as a result of that, they then become the proclaimers of the reality of these very things. And he fulfills the role of being the sole mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. And in the fulfilling of that role, he fulfills a threefold office, distinguishable in function and yet an indissoluble reality, namely that he is both prophet, and he is priest, and he is king. And as prophet, he comes to teach us, and as priest, he comes to reconcile us, and as king, he comes to rule and to reign over us. And so, with that as an introduction, and with the title which I have now given to you, I want to consider with you the role of Jesus as the prophet. He fulfills the function that the Father has given him. And you will remember that Jesus is there as the voice from heaven comes, this is my beloved son, listen to him. Listen to him. People say, why would I ever listen to Jesus? Because he is the son of God because he is the creator of the universe, because he is the great shepherd of the sheep, because he is the light of the world, because he is the only savior, because he is the only one who is qualified to save, because he has risen from the dead and is alive forevermore, because he is coming back and you have an appointment with him, whether you realize it or not. That's the first few things I suggest to you as to why you might be prepared to consider him, why you might listen to him. The Old Testament gave, as we read it, a clear and uh, obvious presentation of the fact that these three offices in the Old Testament, the office of the priest, the office of the, the, the prophet, and the office of the king, were marked by the anointing of God. Marked by the anointing of God. Moses was the first major prophet. And that's why we read from Acts chapter 3. Because here Peter tells the Jewish people who are listening to him, Essentially, you know, if you would have listened to Moses, you would not have got this wrong because Moses is a prophet. And you would have noticed in the reading that it is Moses who is pointing forward to the great prophet who will come. And that's why when we read the Gospels, we're not surprised then to discover that we meet Jesus as prophet. And people responded to him in that way. For example, uh, when the widow's son, uh, the widow of Nain's son, was raised, in that context, people began to say to one another, a great prophet has risen among us. When the 5,000 were fed, they said, this is indeed the prophet who has come into the world. When he returns to the synagogue in Nazareth, and reads from the scroll and gives an explication of it, uh, the response is, no, there is no prophet acceptable in his hometown. So, uh, the early church saw the fulfillment of all those prophetic expectations in Jesus. In Jesus, the prophetic word of God finds its fulfillment, finds its ultimate expression as a truth not only of his teaching, but of his person. That Christ in himself is truth. Prophets spoke the word of truth. Christ is himself truth. 
And that's why when Paul writes to the Galatians, he says the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and of knowledge. Now, we could go on at a dreadful length to rehearse this. I'm going to assume that you're with me so far and that you're prepared to accept that the Old Testament is what it said and that Jesus is the fulfillment of that. Some of you are then saying to yourself, so what? Which is good, because you should be. And I want to answer the so what in the balance of the time. What is the significance of the fact that Jesus fills the role of the prophet, that he is the prophet of God? What is the significance, first of all, in terms of faith, secondly, in terms of preaching, and thirdly, in terms of everyday evangelism? Why would it even matter to spend a Friday night considering the fact of the person and work of Jesus vis-a-vis a a prophet? Incidentally, in each um, each of these aspects, there is, if you like, an implicit judgment. And the judgment in terms of this is, of course, that God gives us prophets because we need them. We are by nature ignorant of God. Men and women are ignorant of God. God has placed eternity in their hearts. We know that from Ecclesiastes. We know that by just living with people. But they're ignorant of God. They're darkened in their understanding. They're blind to the will and purpose of God. And they need the prophet of God. They need God to open their blind eyes. They need God to unstop their deafness. And that's why when you take the best of hymnody, and we've had some wonderful songs this evening, when you take the best of hymnody, it will reinforce all these things. Remember, he speaks, and listening to his voice, what's the answer? There you go. New life the dead receive. Listening to his voice. Not listening to my voice. There's no, there has never been anybody who was dead came alive as a result listening to my voice. I can guarantee that. I sometimes have my lunch in a graveyard near my home to remind me of the fact that that's where I'm heading and that time is running past. But it is also to remind me of the fact that if I were to stand up outside one of the gravestones and call out the name of the person, come out from there. There is as much chance of that happening as there is of anybody being converted as a result of the sound of my voice. We need, you see, we need Jesus to preach to us. Jesus preaches the Bible to us. How weird and amazing and wonderful is it, and we'll see this in a moment or two, that God, I think Calvin says, deigns to use the tongue of one man in the conversion of another man. But you see, until Christ teaches, we never learn. Until he is made to us wisdom, we will never be wise for salvation. That's why he is absolutely vital in bringing men and women to faith. Thomas Watson, in The Body of Divinity, he's got a wonderful passage in which he addresses the condition of humanity in darkness. Remember uh, that... uh, uh, they bought into the, they overturned the truth of God for a lie, and uh, their, their foolish hearts uh, were darkened. They were darkened. You don't have to be a genius to see the darkness around us, do you? Goodness gracious. Their foolish hearts were darkened. Says Watson, in the dark, great beauty is hidden. Flowers, paintings. You never see them if you wake up in the middle of the night going for a drink of water. If not, if it's pitch dark, no, you can't see them. And so he says, man in his natural state sees no beauty in Jesus. Spiritual darkness, he says, is worse than natural because the latter scares us, scared in the dark. But says Watson, men and women do not tremble at their condition. They like it well enough. Who is going to say this? Who is going to speak into a broken world such as ours? Who is it that men and women need to hear from? 
the prophet, the Lord Jesus Christ himself. We need to have come out of these last two months, two years, saying to people, don't fear COVID-19. Fear him who can destroy the body and soul in hell. If you want to get worried about something, worry about this. And while you're confronted by it, understand this, that that God loved you so much that he sent his prophet in many and various ways. Other prophets came and went. This one, in the last days, he has spoken to us by his son. Christ then comes as the prophet to teach our hearts. And when we use the word hearts, we know that that is the epicenter of our existence. It it involves our emotions, our minds, and our wills. And of course, he does. He comes to show us our need. Zacchaeus, come down. I didn't know you knew I was up here. Oh, yeah, I knew you were up here. Come down. What kind of conversation that must have been. What a radical transformation. He didn't come out and say, you know, I've decided to become a religious person. Jesus was in, and uh, he suggested a number of things I could do, and I'm going to stop doing a number of things. No, no. Salvation has come to this house. I'd love to have been in that town when that lady came back shouting, Come see a man. Come see a man. Goodness gracious, that was a pretty gutsy move, wasn't it? After all, she'd had five husbands, and she was living with a guy, and now she's walking around the market shouting, come see a man. People are going, this is unbelievable. She's on number seven, and she's proud of it. Here she is. No, no, she says, you must meet this man. This man told me everything I ever did. Who knows everything you ever did? Only the prophet. Who can deal with it? Only the prophet. And that's exactly it. The light of reason, the light of reason will no more help a man or woman to believe than the light of a candle will help you to understand. The light of reason will no more, because our minds are messed up by the darkness. We think wrongly. We need someone to come and speak into that. We need a prophet from God. Then he opened their minds to understand the Scriptures. Haven't you found that? Perhaps this is true in your experience. You've been in church, and you've taken maybe a friend, and as the minister is trying his best, your heart is stirred within you, and uh, you get to the closing hymn, and it's been a wonderful time. And you say to your friend, and what do you think? The friend says, I don't have a clue what the guy was talking about. (laughs) This is the reality. What's the difference? Well, that chap only heard the minister. You heard Jesus. I mean, how do you explain it when you preach a passage and 20 different people tell you that that word was just for them? People come to you and say, did you know my diary? Have Have you been looking in my study? No, of course, obviously not. No, it's Jesus. All right, that is concerning faith. Secondly, what about the significance in relationship to preaching? Augustine says that he, that is God, has a pulpit in heaven who converts souls, but he has his servants on earth. And uh, let's say a word or two about the importance of uh, pastors and teachers. Old clay pots earthen vessels who have been set apart by God. Ephesians, we read from Ephesians 3 earlier in our prayer time upstairs, but in Ephesians, uh, we know that they have been set apart by God in order that they might uh, uh, edify the saints so that men and women might then do the works of ministry. And of course, the reality of preaching is found in this as well, because Christ was not only anointed for himself, but he was anointed also for his people, that the power of the Spirit of God may be obvious in the ongoing preaching of the gospel. You understand that? That in Christ, the anointing of God 
on Jesus, the pouring out of the Spirit, was received by Christ and is imparted in turn to those who are the servants of Christ. So that in preaching, the minister is invited to participate in the ongoing office of Christ as the prophet. The preacher is not up there to say, do you know how much I know? The task of preaching in teaching the Bible is not simply to take a passage of Scripture, try and explain what it means, and then give people three pointers as to how they might be able to do something with it uh, when they've had their lunch on a Sunday. No, the point, th that's fine. But the point of preaching is that the Spirit of God does the work of God by the Word of God by creating a divine encounter between the preacher, the listener, and God himself. In other words, something is supposed to happen at, an, at a fundamental level. Why is it that people don't like preaching? One reason is because there's so much rotten preaching. The facts. And one of the reasons so much rotten preaching is because people don't pray for their preachers. They don't pray for them before they preach. They don't pray for them while they preach. They don't pray for them after they preach. They frankly don't pray for them. And if I give you a word of exhortation, remember this, that the reason that Spurgeon was as effective as he was in Victorian England was directly related to what he called his boiler room, which was down underneath the auditorium where he preached. There were literally hundreds of people saying, God, speak through the servant today. This, you see, is the need for the prophetic word, for the prophetic word, not the pathetic word. You read the newspapers of state work, and I don't want to say anything about Scotland, but let's, let's talk about England. The, the, the <laughs> fact of the... No, I, I don't want to be unkind about anybody there at all, but it's all so, it, it's all so bland. It's all so innocuous. It's all so theologically vague and harmlessly accommodating. It's the kind of thing that... It's like, it's like lousy cheese, you know. It doesn't, it doesn't smell. It doesn't do anything. It, it, it's just like... Like that. And people are looking and say, why would I give up good Sunday morning when I can play golf and go listen to like that? Well, of course, they wouldn't and they shouldn't. What's happened? A loss of confidence in the very gospel itself. A loss of confidence. Just when the world, just when our culture is badly in need of an adventure. It's not just a difficult task that is entrusted to the preacher. It's an impossible task. If our attempts do not fail, it can only be understood as grace, sheer, endless grace. <laughs> Tillich, you don't often hear Tillich quoted on a night like this, but anyway, in his book, The Trivialization of God, has an amazing quote. He says, The preacher may be delivering a half-baked sermon, thrown together with as much doubt as faith, and the hearers may be distracted by strained efforts to quieten gassy stomachs, or irritated from fighting with a spouse, or worried about a visit to the doctor. Fair? I mean, I love it when they, when they want to start the service with, uh, you know, I just want to praise you, live my hands. <laughs> really? I know my congregation. Some of them were shouting their, their wife as they got out of the car. I heard them. And nobody wants to know what I want to do first thing on a Sunday morning. I want to say, like, I don't want to be here. I want to go home and read the paper. I don't want to say. So let's just be honest before we start. Right. That would be a good start. Because we don't come together to tell God these things. What God has said to us is far more important than what we have to say to him. The task isn't merely difficult, it's impossible. Back to Tillich, this is what he says. So somebody's tummy's rumbling. Somebody's got a doctor's appointment. Somebody's annoyed with their wife. That's all going on. That's every single Sunday, every single place in the entire universe, I guarantee it. But, says Tillich, when the word of the gospel is preached, Christ walks among his people, spurning the language of angels to speak with the tongues of mortals. But when the gospel is preached, by whom? By Christ. How is Christ preaching? 
We remember when Paul writes uh, to one of the, the, the churches, is it Colossians or Ephesians? Maybe Ephesians. He says, that, and, and Christ came and preached to you. Well, Christ never went to Ephesus to preach. We know that. What does he mean? When the gospel was preached, Christ preached to them. You know, I think if, if, you can get a slight grasp, if we can get a slight grasp of this, it would change a lot of things. Luther, along the same lines, it is a right excellent thing that every honest pastor and preacher's mouth is Christ's mouth. Watson again, those that refuse to hear Christ speaking in the ministry of the Word, Christ will refuse to hear speaking on their deathbed. Now, what I'm saying to you, loved ones, is surely the time is ripe for God to pour out His Spirit on our nation, on our nations, and raise up those entrusted with a prophetic ministry. And I'm not suggesting for a moment explaining the future or determining the date of the, of the return of Jesus. A prophetic ministry, a ministry that understands the time and understands the Bible and with grace and with kindness and yet with fearlessness can actually speak into the culture and actually make a dent for Jesus. Speak as Jesus spoke, not as we're tempted to do. The solemnity of the privilege shouldn't be minimized. But the task of the gospel proclamation involves not only the pastor who has the responsibility of this, but each of us, each of us. And with that, I finish. What is the significance in terms of faith? Well, we need the prophet to come and speak to our weaknesses and to our understanding and to our darkness. What about in terms of the responsibility of the preacher? Well, we've got to lose ourselves and uh, set forward Jesus. You know, the, the, the subtext of what happens when you stand in front of people is very significant. And, the, and it's a subtext for a congregation as well. If the subtext of the congregation is, you know, we're the people that understand everything. We're really great. But if people come in, they get that vibe very, very quickly. Or if the subtext is, you know, uh, isn't... Uh, isn't isn't, isn't the preacher good? Isn't the truth important? Fine. But what's the real test? Isn't Jesus Christ incomparably wonderful? Speak, O Lord, as we come to Thee to receive the truth of Your Holy Word, the food of Your Holy Word. Take Your truth, plant it deep in us, shape and fashion us in your likeness. That's what we're saying. So that then when we go back into the thoroughfare, back to join the 300 people that support Kilmarnock, <laughs> I just did that for you. They just, yeah. Um, Jesus said to his disciples, he said, listen, boys, I know that you like to say there's four months and then the harvest comes, but I want to tell you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields. They're white for harvest. I don't think you will get an argument with any person that you meet in the next week by asking them if they believe that our world is broken. Everybody knows it's broken. The question is, why is it broken? And is there anyone who can fix it? And if we're going to take that up, then we need, and I'm going to give you three C's and I'm done. First of all, we need to approach the privilege with confidence. Confidence not in our ability. Confidence in the gospel itself. Because just as our world is becoming more and more aware of the fact that it can't fix anything, we, as a church, are becoming less and less convinced of our mission. And the reason for the loss of conviction regarding the mission is found in a diminishing confidence in the message that we have to proclaim. I mean, do you believe that he breaks the power of canceled sin and sets the prisoner free? Do you believe that he is the risen, ascended king? Do you believe that he is the returning Lord? Do you believe that over all the chaos of our world, he reigns, actually, 
Do you believe that nothing is out of control and nothing will be out of control because of who he is? That takes us to Sunday night. We go to our friends and neighbors and we say, you know, love is a many splendored thing, isn't it? Did you ever know this? This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us, that he gave himself as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. That's why we must go on and tell them about the priest who sacrificed himself to satisfy divine justice. Why we've got to tell them that he is the king so that they might know that he is able to come and subdue our rebellious hearts. So we need confidence in the message, and we need courage, as the second C, to proclaim it. That's the apostolic pattern, isn't it? What I receive from the Lord, that I also deliver to you. Peter, there is salvation in no one else. No name, no other name under heaven given amongst men by which we might be saved. Runs completely contrary to our worldview, doesn't it? It absolutely does. That's why it's so tough. That's why it's so exciting. There is no doubt, I would say, in any of our minds that biblical Christianity, biblical Christianity, is the prime enemy of Marxist, radical, feminist, deconstructed ideology. The supreme target is Jesus Christ, the prophet. That is where the evil one has lined up his attack. And we are the servants of Jesus. We're going to go and run away and hide? How about you in your small corner and I in mine? This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. My little corner. Claims for final truth in Jesus are not simply, um, you know, set aside. They're completely opposed. And the last C is the word uh, compassion. If we're going to uh, take this up, this reality of the incomparable nature of Jesus as the one who speaks into our world, we need compassion. You say, well, you didn't sound very compassionate when you said that earlier. Well, I apologize, but at least I got to it in the end. When he saw the crowd, he was moved with compassion, for he saw them as sheep without a shepherd. The good shepherd gave his life for the sheep. Jesus is his own best evidence. Jesus is his own best evidence. Just, just tell people about Jesus. He's fantastic. Do you realize this? He's terrific. Remember what we were? We were foolish. We were disobedient. We were led astray. We were slaves to all kinds of passions and pleasures. We passed our days in malice and in envy. We were hated by others, and we hated one another. But then, but then. No, we have to be bold. We have to be courageous. We've got to be clear, and we've got to speak with respect. Caring enough to listen. Caring enough to provide. Caring enough to speak. Relentless in our pursuit willing to set aside our own agendas for the well-being of those who have never understood one single word of the gospel that we gather tonight to ponder. And realizing that the story, for example, and with this I will finish, the story of the fellows who, who brought the man to Jesus. Remember on the bed? Most of us who ever made it through Sunday school, the, the way that was taught to us was clear, but it wasn't particularly helpful. Because it went like this. These four guys really love this fellow. Do you love people? And I'm like, I don't know. And furthermore, they went out of their way. When's the last time you went out of your way? It's the same way they taught us the, 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 the feeding of the 5,000. Look at this little boy. He's bailed Jesus out. What a problem Jesus had. Was it wasn't for that little boy, who knows what would have happened? Are you kidding me? Even when I was in Sunday school, I goes, I don't think that's right. I, I wasn't that smart. I don't think that's the point that's being made here. The point is, he can create ex nihilo. The miracle is not that the boy gave his lunch. The miracle is that the creator of the universe did anything with the jolly lunch. It's fantastic. And so the fellow, he goes on the bed, and the four fellows take him. Right? So, you know the story. Down through the roof. And everybody's looking. 
And Jesus says, what does he say? Son, your sins are forgiven. You talk about a letdown? Those guys would have said, we didn't bring him here for an invisible forgiveness. We brought him here for a physical transformation. What he needs is his legs, Jesus. They're going to tell the prophet what he's supposed to say. That's what's happening right now at a very different level. The real need of people is this. The real need of people is that. We've got to fix this. We've got to deal with that. That's why we're here. We're carrying people, and we're like this in the same position. We're going to tell Jesus what the problem is and how he can fix it. And Jesus, of course, says what he says. And the Pharisees say, who can forgive sins but God alone? I can't believe he's saying that. Jesus knowing what they're saying. He says to him, he says, listen, what do you think is the hardest thing to say? Either your sin's forgiven or take up your bed and walk. You probably would agree that it'd be easier to say your sins are forgiven because how do you verify that? Your sins are forgiven. Have a great evening, right? But if you go take up your bed and walk and he doesn't take up his bed and walk, you know you don't have a leg to stand on, so to speak. <laughs> so remember what he said. In order that you might know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, I say to you, take up your bed and walk. Now, what was Jesus doing? He was putting his finger on the man's greatest need. He was putting his finger on everybody's greatest need. The need to hear the prophet's voice. The need to be reconciled to God the Father through the work of God the Son by the power of the Holy Spirit. And we have this incomparable Christ who has come and made us his own. And we have pastors for whom we can pray. And we have friends and neighbors and children and grandchildren who are just desperately in need of the story that we have to tell. So the great encouragement of a night like this is not while we're all here, but it's while we're all gone, because now we can scatter and let people know. They say, what was that guy on about in there? They say, well, he went on forever, but he was basically trying to say one thing. And then he stopped. <laughs> Father, thank you that we can read the Bible for ourselves. We're sensible people, and we can weave our way through all these words. Grant that we might hear your voice in the midst of many words. And if anything is untrue or unkind or unhelpful, maybe be banished from our recollection. Plant your word in us, Lord. Fulfill your purposes through us. For Jesus' sake. Amen.